Hey, Michael, uh, thank you so much for signing up. Thank you so much for having very cool footage. I, I like the seeker thing. That's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, your, your throw is really good, really good. Like most people that come to me do not have things figured out as much as you do. So this is a good like stretch for me of like, I looked at first and I was like, crap, I can't help this guy. He's throwing fine. But then I look like closer and slow everything down. I'm like, oh, okay, there's some, there's some subtle stuff that we can do that I think will get you a lot more power because like your throw looks almost perfect, but you still have the same force leaks as everyone else. So let's jump into it. So the, the first, first thing that I see that's suspect, oh, broke it. No idea what that was. Now we're gluing washers to things. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> Adventures on YouTube. Super, oh, it's this super glue LED thing. I don't even know what the heck that is. Let's just go back. It's one of those annoying things that's been popping up on my feed for a million years. And I've never looked at it. Okay. Short detour. So... Um, the, the first area of, I can blow this up a little bit, first area of potential concern is the, looking at how you're, I'm going to forget to move that later. So let's go like this. So they're both in frame. Cool. Um, so just looking at this front foot, um, click back into the video and then frame by frame. So just looking at where it is setting down and where it's reaching to, you're the tiniest bit toe forward, like three degrees, some tiny, tiny fraction of an amount. Um, so not necessarily a problem, but while we're changing the brace and trying to get more containment on the front leg, I would encourage you to play around with the idea of setting this toe backwards on about a 30 degree angle. So you, the angle doesn't matter, play with it, see what feels good. But you want your toe to set down and then your heel to move, set down closer to the target by, by a couple inches, two or three inches. So what that'll do is it'll change how the weight loads into your foot, which will change how the weight loads into your leg, which will change how your hip works in general. So as we move forward through the brace, right? Everything's okay, no big flags. But here we start to see the foot rocking onto the outside blade of the foot. And then, then we see the, the foot start to break off of the ground. and then settle down again. So there's some de-weighting of the front foot happening. And that starts here. While the disc is just coming out of your pocket. So like your deepest pocket is probably like right there. So I'm looking at the, the one on the right. Um, so I'm looking here, that's your deepest pocket position. And then going back to looking at the foot, it starts to rock up onto the blade there. And then it starts to de-weight a little bit here. So what that means to me, backing up a decent amount, is that the only reason, the only way the foot can de-weight is if the hips are going up. So given your bracing, we don't want your hips going up. We want your hips going down. So your, your rear, look at your rear leg, like it's internally rotating, but that hip is, it looks like it, the rear hip looks like it has a slightly upward vector and to back up all the way, I'm not sure why that's happening. It could just be an optical illusion, like who knows, but it looks from here, it looks like your hips start going up. So yeah, so it's because it's because your front leg is pole vaulting basically. So because you have more momentum going 
forward then you do containment in your brace leg it means that delete delete it means that your front leg if you start bracing here your hips are going to continue moving forward and you're going to pull vault over your front foot so that has to happen to some extent um, but we want to minimize it while the disc is in your hand in order to keep your hips flat and stable and in the same spot while the rotation of the torso is happening so that you are throwing from a stable consistent platform right so the opposite of that is if we are horrible at disc golf and we do all of the beginner things that we don't want to do right if if we take too big of an x step get everything turned over here and then from here the only way to get power is to rotate forward and crank your spine over if we do that then our throw becomes this and our swing plane is all the heck over the place and nothing has any power right the opposite of that is if we get on a hyzer tilt we establish that hyzer tilt by having the leg behind us and we get all of our power boom to happen right here on that axis all the rotation happens in one spot the hips don't move the hips don't drift forward the hips don't drift up then you have power then you have hip snap and arm snap and everything's good right so you really want that front leg to lock into the ground and stay there and not move at all for a very quick i don't know quarter half of a second while you come through your power pocket position to your release so that's what we're going to work on establishing a little bit more and the first thing to do is get this foot angle back and then we might want to change your footwork a little bit so the the x step is decently long um that's okay but look at how it's it's okay as long as it doesn't turn your hips back too early but look at how far turned back your hips are at this point so on the other angle like your hips are pointed here bell buckle is pointed like that way right and you're you're just getting on to your x step right so i wouldn't i wouldn't want to see the hips peak backwards I wouldn't want to see them get to their most backwards position. I wouldn't want to see them start moving back until here, where your X step, where your plant step crosses your X step. So that's where I would say you're allowed to start coiling into your back hip. And you are already coiled into your back hip. You're not going to turn any more any farther backwards here. I don't think. No, you're already starting to open into that front hip. Not too much, that's fine. Yeah, so there's a there's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of overstriding into the brace. Um, so we can make that step smaller, and the best way to do that is to make the X step smaller. Ooh, doing all sorts of weird stuff. Okay. So we want to shorten the X step. So rather than going boom and turning the hips back on that step, we're going to make the X smaller, like right here. Well, I shouldn't wear different color socks when I do this. It makes it look weird. <laughs> so you, initial step here, X step right here, and then you're going to go in. So what, what this allows me to do is keep the hips lateral to the target. So my belt buckle is still pointed sideways east on the T-pad at the camera filming. I'm throwing that way. So my belt buckle can stay here, and it only starts to turn back as I reach towards my plant I coil into this rear hip and then I land with the heel well forward and get a good counterweight so what you're doing is you're you have more momentum and you're taking a longer x step and your hips are turning back on the x step then my hips are already back and it's too easy for me to crank open and go too far and end up too far on top of my brace right so basically we're trying to stay there's two ways to think about it. One way is we're trying to stay low here so that we can get this out well in front and have a more aggressive angle into the brace so that we can get containment better and not pull vault up on top of the brace. Um, that's kind of a beginner way to think about it, a more advanced way to think about it, which is probably honestly more where you're at. 
is that you want to lift up on the X step. No, excuse me, lift up on the initial step. So I'm gonna go initial, lift, and drop into the X so that I have more down force going into my brace so that I'm less likely to pull vault up over the brace and more likely to have the front leg lock into the ground and then have the rear hip drop down under. So just to tie into that real quick, um, the drill that I end up having most players that I work with start with is the one leg drill. It's on the channel. You can see the long version of it. There's um, the new one leg drill is the name of the title of the most recent one. There's also four videos that I went through defining how I wanted to run that drill. So there's a lot of background info if you want to watch all of it. But basically what you're going to do is you're going to take your foot, you're going to turn it 30 degrees back. This helps establish that your hit is not at 12 directly towards your target, but your hit is at 10 and the disc is going to rip out and go towards 12. Um, you probably understand that already. We can talk about it more if you don't. Um, but this 30 degree tilt in your foot just helps line up your body's force projection to the correct point. Don't have to think about that much. It just happens. Um, then from here, you're going to extend your knee all the way, lock your knee out, not into hyperextension, but pretty darn close to full extension, if not full extension. And then you're going to tape your hip socket and you're going to press it backwards like you were trying to do a hamstring stretch, right? Knees and hips both go back and now I feel a stretch in my hamstrings. You're doing that in one leg and finding balance with your weight over the heel specifically. So you're gonna maintain that position and then all you're gonna to do to start to feel out the drill is you're gonna to come to a hyzer tilt, dab your back toe on the ground and then you're gonna lift your rear hip, keeping the leg totally in place, lift the rear hip and drop the rear hip. So if our hips are flat, um, which no one should ever throw flat, and you spin them, which no one should ever do, when you spin your hips, the rear hip is just gonna spin past and keep going because there's no possible way to contain it, right? But this, as soon as you get on a hyzer tilt, now when I pick this hip, when I twirl my hips, this hip goes up, my rear hip goes up, and then when I drop, it goes down. Now all of a sudden I'm here and I have containment, right? So this containment in my hips can cause an endpoint to my impulse in my shoulders, can cause everything to snap out towards 10 o'clock, which makes everything start to work, right? That's the magic. Don't throw towards 12, snap at 10, and the disc will go towards 12 with more efficiency and more power. So that's the core idea. Um, the reason it works is because it makes your front leg actually static. So um, when I give this drill to beginners, I say, okay, do it, film it, send it to me. I'll check and make sure you're not moving your knee. And they film video and they go, okay, my knee's not moving. Okay, did I do it? And they bent their knee 30 degrees. And I say politely, no, you did not do it right. You bent your knee 30 degrees, try again. And then the other thing they'll do is they'll wind the knee up this way and wind it up that way. Um, dangerous for knee ligaments because you're loading the inside and then loading the outside. You want to load everything equally and have the rotation be isolated above the hip socket. So the leg isn't moving. There's no this, this. There's even no extension and uh, flexion yet. You're just keeping the leg there and organizing everything else around the leg. And that's, that's where the power comes from, is I'm dropping this and hanging it off of the ground. So if I actually hold this still, the bones stack and organize correctly, and I'm essentially dropping this hip on a post where it can actually rotate quickly and accelerate. If, so, so just for example, like here, there's a lot of power because I keep my knee strong, right? If I don't keep my knee strong, all that power that just came out in my hand, there's nothing that makes it go because everything just gets absorbed into the knee because the knee is giving. So 
the same thing happens in your throat to a much lesser extent because there's give in the rock up to the blade of the foot and there's give in the hip drifting upward a little bit so i can't even really see your hip lifting but i can tell that it has to be because the foot is rolling so if the foot is rolling then that means the hip has to be drifting forward and in order for the hip to be going forward the hip has to be going up as a function of that point is staying there the hip is moving it has to be moving on the arc that's defined by the leg right so there's a little bit of motion in your front hip still. The way to get rid of that is to make the brace stronger. The way to make the brace stronger is to get this drill figured out and then get the heel down and the weight into the heel. Because if the weight goes into the heel and the knee is used to being here and being static and not having this scoopy knee drift thing happen, um, you're not doing that bad. You're doing a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit of it. Um, but the more of that you can get rid of, the better. And when you can get rid of it and get your heel forward, you can really start to push into that front leg. Um, so I went to the field for like three or four times a week for six months trying to brace hard, but I was afraid of hurting my knee. So I would always do hip escapes. Like I'd plant and go like do a little hop or let my knees swivel out and that's avoiding force, right? So the, it's the same as this. If I drop into the knee, I'm avoiding expressing force with my leg out of a subconscious fear of preserving my knee, right? So once you get rid of that by learning how to keep the knee actually static, then when you get, so first you do that, then you learn to load the knee and unload the knee, So, but it's still linear, there's no, wobble or rotation um, so what that'll look like is you'll load and unload so from the side load and unload and you get this bend and extend that's it pumps the movement a little bit right because you're loading there's expansion and then contraction and expansion again that peaks right before or right after release. Your leg kind of kicks a little bit after, but you're getting some of that pump to go into the disc. That will also come out in, um, this is very advanced, but when you get the timing right, the disc, because it's going on this arc around your elbow, will get heavy. Like it'll start to weigh something like 20 pounds, even though it only weighs 175 grams because it's accelerating so much when the disc gets heavy in your hand you can actually lever the hip against it and that's how players get to like 600 700 feet is they're using that effect so your body can't throw something this light very effectively that's why beginners go i'm gonna throw it with my arm what we need to do is throw that like it's this right if you're gonna throw this thing you're gonna wind up you're gonna brace and you're gonna huck it we our body won't do that with something that light so you have to get the late acceleration to happen so that you have something to brace against and and resist and really lever against the brace um but that's way more advanced but that's where we're going to right and that's where i think you'll be able to get to relatively quickly because of how well you're throwing already so i think that's about it but let's take a look See if we can find something else to nitpick. Oh, the your uh, swing plane could maybe change. But what, what I find um, is that correcting swing plane is usually a waste of time. Because if you just correct the hips, it'll correct the problem with the swing plane anyways. Yeah, okay, so no, we could we could correct a little bit there. So, okay, so I would say your pocket is a little bit late. And like, again, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on trying to correct this because it basically doesn't work. 
but just so you're aware of it. It'll be corrected by correcting the lower body stuff. Changing your arm isn't really going to do a whole lot. But because of the little bit of spine lean towards the back, so leaning towards the camera is good. Leaning towards the back maybe half as much as you are is good. But because you have this lean here, you're going to tend to have a similar lean on the front side. And, and I think that's too much. So this amount of spine lean crank over where your spine is going from here to there is slowing down your throw a little bit. So if you could limit that to about half as much as what it is, I think you would be able to get a snappier rotation in your spine. And so because you have a little too much lean here, you have a little bit too much length in your reach back. And that makes your elbow getting through a little bit slow. And I think you're doing a little bit of a bicep curl here where you're pulling the disc in rather than driving the elbow forward. We'll look at the, the back view on this one too. And that's, that's part of what causes the disc angle to change. So it, I think you were pretty flat and then here you're pretty not flat and then it's gonna change again. So then it's back to flat. And then it goes back to hyzer. So there's a lot of, yeah, then it's back to hyzer. Is that right? Let's look at that again. So flat flares up pretty quickly to a hyzer, stays on a hyzer, comes back to flat as your elbow lifts up. That's normal, that's correct. No, so it's, it's that's fine. You're, again, doing a very advanced thing. Um, so, just to go over that so I don't look like an idiot. <clears throat> oh, I look like an idiot because you can't see me. Okay, so what you're doing there is fine there's absolutely nothing wrong with it you're reaching back flat the disc is flaring this way that's odd it's flaring this way right this is what i was talking about you're gonna make me work for it so there's reach back it flares into hyzer tucks back to flat and then back to hyzer. That's interesting. I'll have to spend some time thinking about that. So most guys, most pros reach back flat with their elbow oriented here, bring the disc into a tight pocket, a deep pocket, and then do exactly the thing that you're doing. So you're, you're already on hyzer at this point. So you reach back flat, flare into hyzer which is is sketchy um a lot of people do that and it doesn't work you're doing it and it does work so you're here other guys are here and then because your shoulder plane is tilted right shoulder planes here when the elbow continues the shoulder continues forward on the shoulder plane it pulls the elbow up with it and there's a reflection that happens around this point in the forearm so elbow low disc high as you pull around that flips and you end up low so you're you're pulling through here and getting to that so maybe play around with suitcasing if you want extra credit play around with pulling here because that'll get you rolling to more rolling towards nose down instead of what you're doing which is rolling towards flaring into nose up potentially as long as your timing is right on your wrist roll on your release it doesn't matter and it's totally fine um and all of the weird flary things like people like Mattio and um calvin that reach back very high it doesn't matter because as long as they get to the right hit point with the right nose angle then it's fine it's totally irrelevant where they came from as long as you have the whip right uh, so let's take one more look at that 
So it's weird that you flare into, that you reach back flat and then flare into hyzer. But as long as you stay in hyzer. So that, that little bobble there is interesting. Yeah, so there's a little wobble. That's it's not the end of the world, but take a look at the back angle too. Yeah, that's better. I can see more. Yeah, so I think that's a little bit of a bicep curl because the disc is coming up faster than your elbow is driving forward. And there, that's that's um, that's an active wrist curl, I think. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Chris Taylor, who coaches for pros, will tell you there is something wrong with that. He hates it. I don't think it matters that much. Huh. I would, I'd be curious to see um, tech disc numbers of what your wobble is like. I can't, I don't claim to be able to visually identify. It looks like a decent amount of wobble though. So that, that might be a factor in getting beyond 400. But I would, I would play around with making the arm more passive and getting rid of some of that active wrist curl. Um, not a big thing by any means, but I would play with it. The footwork changes and bracing infinitely more important than tweaking the arm like i want to make that clear but if you are bored and enjoy tweaking arm form stuff be my guest happy to to help guide that as much as possible but what i'm what i'm seeing is you reach back here with this elbow orientation again which is fine as long as you're getting to a hit point that you're happy with with an amount of wobble that you're happy with but there's a little bit of torquing of things that happens in the back, which can start to set the disc into confusion about where you want it to end up. Um, but what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a little bit of a, what looks like a bicep curl, where it should be the only reason the disc moves in towards your chest is because your elbow is being driven forward. So then there's a whole nother thing of like, do you want to go deep pocket or do you want to have a good hit where the rip out essentially makes a deep pocket? Um, if that doesn't make any sense, happy to spend more time talking about that, but that's a whole separate discussion. Um, so, so what I'm seeing is a little bit of bicep curl. So rather than your elbow being driven ahead of the rotation, and getting the disc to curl in because of that, I, I see the elbow not being driven forward as much as we might like, and the bicep curl bringing the disc in, and then a wrist curl bringing the disc in more. So when that happens, this muscle and this muscle are turned on, bicep and wrist flexors are turned on, which, which means that on the way out, those muscles are still on and have to be overcome by the force so if instead of bicep curling and wrist curling if i can leave that loose and just throw the elbow forward i'm going to get more loose relaxed whip and i'm going to have more speed on the way out potentially so that would be one thing i would consider playing with is allowing the arm to be passive and really having the idea that the only reason the arm is going to curl in so this is totally dead loose i'm just going to slap my bicep above my elbow that way and watch what happens to the hand. It curls into the chest, right? So if I'm here and I imagine that I've cut this off and I'm just gonna drive my stub forward as fast as I can on top of my rotating hips, on top of my rotating shoulders, I'm just gonna drive this. That's gonna make the disc and my elbow and my wrist all curl in passively. And then as I continue to drive this forward and it runs out of space and continues around in an arc behind me. So now I'm just gonna push my bicep back behind me. Without doing anything, those two joints both open up again. So I can passively cause my forearm and my hand and the disc to move faster 
if I don't activate my wrist flexors and my bicep. All right, so actively curling in actually hurts you on the way out is the theory. So if you can stay loose, fling everything forward, you can get a more explosive whip on the front end. And when you get your brace working the way that I'm talking about, that being able to lever against the brace just amplifies the whip crack even more. And that's how you start to get to crazy speed and spin numbers. Okay, so I think that's a good place to start. Yeah, that's half an hour. Don't want to bore you to death. Um, yeah, so let's start there. I'd be happy to take a look at your forehand too, but I am not a forehand expert by any means. I can give you a couple tweaks and things to play with if you want to, but I, I do not claim to be an expert on that front. So if you're happy sticking with backhand, I'm happy. If you want to take a look at your forehand, uh, let me know. We can do that too. Um, but your throw looks great. Um, the one leg stuff, is kind of what I would start with. I think that's the, the biggest gains. Um, but let's take a look at your off leg for just a second. So that's it's pretty good. I would I think what I would try to focus on with the the one leg drills is your I'm looking at this one over here. The movement of your foot is it goes east and then up. I would try to get it to go forward more. So I would try to get this foot to go that way more, like on the ground that way, um, and less up in the air. Because when it goes up in the air, so over here when the foot goes this way, it allows the torso to come through this way more, right, doing more of that tipping forward thing that we don't really want but if you get this leg to go straight behind you it'll limit the the over rotation forward of the torso more and i think that would help compress your hit in your pocket so that the l and again the elbow looks a little bit late here i would rather see So the disc is at center chest. I mean, like, that's not bad at all. But I would rather see that position sooner. And then let's look at how your shoulders open. Yeah, so your shoulders are pretty open at your hit. Again, like, nothing wrong with throwing like that. But I think if you want more power, there is more power to be had by keeping your shoulders closed more. So your shoulders, I want to say they look like they're 45, but that angle sure doesn't look like 45 when I draw it. Um, but the, the more closed you can get that angle. So, um, Chris Taylor, who coaches for Dave Wiggins has, uh, motion capture data on Wiggins. And he says that on his power shots, his shoulders are only open 10 degrees to the target. So if the target line is here, then Wiggins shoulders are only 10 degrees past that. And you're... Uh, I mean, I don't know, guessing you're at at least 20. So, I mean, it's it's pretty close. But the more the point is, the more you can get this leg to not be... Let's see how to draw. I, I can't draw it well in this perspective. But um, if this is the T-pad, we're looking at it from the top. Your rear leg is here. Say your rear leg is there and your torso ends up here if we could instead get the rear leg to be here directly east on the t-pad then the torso wouldn't come forward as much so by by getting the leg to go forward more it limits the forward motion of the hand in the front shoulder basically so you just, it's just another way to get more containment behind the brace. And containment behind the brace is what allows the force to be compressed into the tip of the whip, which is what makes it more explosive. So yeah, excellent work so far. Um, I think we can get you to 400 and beyond pretty easily.
So take a stab at all that stuff. I know we threw a lot at you, but you seem like an advanced player, so I think you can hang. Um, if you have questions on any of that, absolutely ask questions. Happy to spend more time making sure all of that is clear. Uh, but yeah, it looks really good. Spend some time on it. Send me some clips of the one leg stuff, and let's make sure you can get that front leg nice and solid. Make sure the knee is not moving. And then we'll try to integrate that back into a throw and see if we can get your brace just that little bit more solid so that you can get more force on the disc. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Good luck.